Hello again and thank you for watching the 8th installment in this series of God's Roadmap to the End. In the previous video we saw how the return of our Lord has to occur at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week in order to avoid contradictions between Revelation 12, Zechariah 14 and Daniel 2. I know that the information that I discuss in these videos are controversial and that it, that it goes against what we have been taught in traditional eschatology, but the difference I believe comes as a result of not approaching the Word of God in a chronological sense, but applying Isaiah 28 verse 10 when interpreting the Word of God. As always, I aim to obtain an understanding of the Word of God that does not result in contradictions between various passages that address the same subject. As such, we know that the positioning of the second coming of Christ at the end of Daniel's 70th week, as traditionally understood from Zechariah 14, would result in a dual event having the crust of the earth split twice in the same location in the land of Israel, and seeing the remnant of Israel fleeing into the wilderness once at the midpoint of the seven year period, and again at the end of it. This is not logical given the fact that the remnant will be protected by God during the second half of Daniel's 70th week for 1260 days and this event must then occur at the midpoint as described by Revelation 12. The events that are then described in Zechariah 14 and Daniel 2 are clearly associated with the information provided in Revelation 12 concerning the remnant of Israel's flight into the wilderness. Another event that is clearly linked to this asteroid impact event is provided in Daniel 2, where the stone, cut without hands, is described hitting the statue at its feet and filling the whole earth and ending the Babylonian system of control over the world. In the previous video we were discussing the first five seal judgments and I have shown how the first five seal judgments occur in the first three and a half years prior to Israel's Messiah's return to the earth at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. I believe that the fifth seal's end is associated with a specific condition and we can therefore know when this concludes. We see the following written. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. When we understand that the Lord returns at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week, we see that those who are slain for the word of God are slain during the first three and a half years. It is clear from this passage that the fifth seal concludes when the last person with original untainted DNA is beheaded for refusing to accept the mark of the beast and for having the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. In addition to this, we know that the two witnesses will also function during the first three and a half years and that their testimony is specifically meant for those who will willingly lay down their lives in order to receive salvation. We see the following written about the two witnesses declaring the duration as well as the end of their testimony. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. From this passage we see that the two witnesses are murdered by the beast at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week, and that they too will willingly lay down their lives to be killed by the Antichrist, just as those have done who refuse to accept the mark of the beast. 
It is important to understand the event that would mark the completion of their testimony in order to correctly understand what Revelation tells us when the sixth seal is opened. So what event marks the completion of the two witnesses' testimony? I believe their testimony completes when the last person with normal DNA containing God's image is murdered for refusing to accept the mark of the beast. After this point, only those who have accepted the mark of the beast will remain on earth with the exception of the remnant of Israel who will be supernaturally protected by God in the wilderness. Just as in the days of Noah, everybody on the earth outside of the ark had the beast's image in their DNA and were destined for destruction by the flood that covered the entire earth. We know then that only those who are created in the image of God are eligible for salvation and for receiving the testimony of Jesus Christ and the word of God. There would be no purpose for the two witnesses testifying on earth once the last person who retained God's image in their DNA has laid down his or her life. I am of the opinion that the two witnesses will follow suit and will willingly choose not to resist being murdered by the beast just as those that they testified to did. This is important to keep in mind as we consider the next seal. Moving on to the sixth seal then, let us focus specifically on the events that are associated with this seal and see how these fit in with the timeline before us and with the trumpet and bowl judgments. I believe the sixth seal judgment starts at the time that the fifth seal concludes and this occurs in my opinion at the midpoint of this seven year period. So let us consider what is written about this. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? It is important to pay close attention to the detail provided in these verses as they provide clues that we have to link to other passages, allowing us to obtain more insight when we tie them together. Before we consider the first section of this passage that describes a cosmic cataclysm, let us shift our focus to the last half of this passage describing to us that every person alive on earth at the time when the seal is opened, will try to hide from him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. We often don't pause long enough to give this passage the required consideration. You will notice that there is no exception given here. Nobody alive on earth at this point would be happy to see the Lord returning to earth. There is no indication in this passage that describes the second coming of the Lord with the positive anticipation that we see Paul describing as the blessed hope in Titus 2 verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. When seal 6 is opened, we see that every bondman and every free man hide themselves from the face of him that sits on the throne. This would then indicate everybody still alive on earth at this point in time, with the exception of the remnant of Israel under God's protection. When we consider the information provided to us in the fifth seal about those who end up under the altar in heaven, being slain for the word of God and that the two witnesses' testimony ends at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week, we begin to understand why everybody alive on earth at the point where the sixth seal is opened would try to hide themselves from him that sits on the throne. By now it should be quite evident that there will only be two groups on the earth at the time when the two witnesses are murdered. This matches the pattern given to us in Genesis when considering the days of Noah, right before the flood came upon the earth. 
The first group represents those that are sealed by God and who, in Revelation's case, are known as the remnant of Israel, protected by God in the wilderness, just as Noah was protected in the ark, lifted above the flood. The second group represents those who have accepted the mark of the beast and will, who will be worshipping the beast and his image just as the Nephilim that were on the earth in Noah's days, who no longer had God's image in their DNA, did. Everybody who refused to accept the mark of the beast in exchange for obtaining salvation through beheading would have been killed at this point, and this is confirmed to us when we see the word of God showing us that the two witnesses are also killed when they have completed their testimony. Complementary and elaborating detail are provided to us about this event as described in Revelation 6, and this is given in Revelation 11 and in Isaiah, Amos and Micah, among other passages that we have to combine with the information in Revelation 6 to obtain a more complete understanding of what is going on. We read the following in Revelation 11. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. This verse in Revelation 11 is linked to the sixth seal being opened, given the reference to the wrath of the Lamb that is come that ties these two verses together. What is noticeable, as in the case of Revelation 6, is the fact that the nations are described as angry when this time arrives. There is once again no other response mentioned as an exception from those alive on the earth at this point in time, and this would have us question at least the positioning of the blessed hope that Paul referred to in Titus 2 verse 13, occurring at the Lord's return to the Mount of Olives. This is further elaborated on when we consider a passage from Amos 5. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord! To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house, and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? Amos clearly tells us that the day of the Lord will be a day of darkness and of judgment and wrath, and that his wrath will be inescapable. We will see why and how the Lord will bring this about as we continue. In Revelation 11 we see in addition the announcement of a period known as the time of the dead that is associated with rewards being given out to God's servants and for those that are dead to be judged and for God to destroy those who are destroying the earth. What would be implied by this, given that this is positioned in the second half of Daniel's 70th week? I believe the answer, even though somewhat controversial again, is revealed to us in Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This passage is clearly associated with the time of the dead and providing us with elaborating information about their judgments and that these people who died without salvation will be judged based on their works. Traditionally, the white throne judgment is positioned at the end of the millennium because this passage is found at the end of Revelation and traditional eschatology would approach this subject based on the written chronology. I would like to pause here to show you why positioning the white throne judgment at the end of the millennium results in contradictions with other passages in the word of God. Firstly, it is important to understand the events that will follow the tribulation and we have to start by considering the condition of the earth and the solar system after God's judgments have been poured out. One passage that describes this to us in some detail is given in Isaiah 24. 
The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. We see this destruction of the earth occurring as a result of the events described during Daniel's 70th week, of which seal 6 that we will soon discuss will provide us with more insight. There are two aspects about this passage that position its application to the time before the millennial reign of Christ. Firstly, we see the mention of the transgression that will be heavy upon the earth. This is linked to the passage in Daniel where Gabriel tells Daniel that an end will be made to the transgression within the 70 weeks that are determined upon Israel. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Based on this information, we understand that the earth will be destroyed within the final week that has been determined over Israel. Positioning the destruction of the earth outside of this time frame will result in a contradiction. The next aspect is the mention of the many days after which the high ones who will be imprisoned will be visited. This is linked to a passage in Revelation 20 that explains to us that Satan and his angels will be bound for a thousand years and will then be released to deceive the nations one final time at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. What is further important to consider is the condition of the earth. The passage from Isaiah tells us that the earth will fall and that it will not rise again. This is very important to understand as traditional eschatology teaches us that the new earth is created at the end of the millennial reign. The problem with this view is the contradictions that this understanding causes with Isaiah 24 that describes the destruction of the earth during Daniel's 70th week and the fact that seal 6 contains information about heaven that departs like a scroll showing us that both heaven and earth is destroyed as part of seal 6's judgment. Taking into account the effects of a relatively small earthquake on a nuclear power station in Japan in 2011, consider the radioactive consequences of several asteroids impacting the earth. Radioactivity will increase to levels that would require God to intervene to ensure that some flesh would survive. If we consider the information provided in God's word, we know that the conditions on earth will not be conducive to supporting life after several asteroid impact events have occurred, even for the remnant under God's protection. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. This passage from Mark shows us that God had to shorten the days by increasing the rotational speed of the earth so that some flesh could be saved from the conditions that will exist on it. It would then be strange to see God putting those that he saved from the conditions on earth back into the same conditions from which they were saved, and having them live for much longer than we are used to on the earth under what we would currently consider favorable conditions. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, 
nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. Isaiah 24 also imposes a prohibition. If God performed any kind of restorative work on the existing earth after it has fallen, it would contradict what Isaiah 24 describes when saying that the earth will fall and that it will not rise again. The only logical conclusion to draw from this then that would not lead to a contradiction with the various passages that we have considered would be for God to do away with the old heaven and the old earth during Daniel's 70th week and to create the new heaven and the new earth at the end of the seven year period right at the beginning of Christ's millennial reign. If this is not the case, those who are saved out of the tribulation will be living on a planet that is highly radioactive to say the least and this will lead to shortened lifespans and not to what we read about in Isaiah 65. Next, let us shift our focus to the White Throne Judgment. Again, according to traditional eschatology, this event is also positioned at the end of the millennium, based on its positioning within the Word of God. But there are two problems with this when we understand that the new heaven and the new earth must be created at the beginning of the millennium. We see God saying the following about the new heaven and the new earth. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. When we compare this verse from Isaiah to another passage from Revelation 20, we see the following written. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. In this passage we see heaven and earth fleeing away from the face of him that sits on the white throne. This can only be the current earth and the current heaven, as the new heaven and earth will not flee from the Lord, but will be created to remain before him according to Isaiah 66. We also see the following passage describing the new earth from Revelation 20 that has a very specific detail that we can compare with another passage. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. This passage describes to us the absence of the sea on the new earth. When we compare this to Revelation 20, we see the following. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This passage specifically tells us that those who have died in the sea will be given up by the sea to be judged by him that sits on the great white throne. This clearly positions the white throne judgment occurring on the earth that will be destroyed and that will flee away from the face of him that sits on the throne. This judgment of people who have died in the sea will have to occur on the earth before the new earth is created, as the new earth will not have a sea in which people will die. It logically follows then that the white throne judgment has to occur during the second half of Daniel's 70th week. The next question that naturally follows is what about those that have been redeemed by Jesus? What will they be doing in the final three and a half years? We see them described in the following passage. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. 
The marriage of the lamb to his wife is described in this passage. It is important to remember that the final portion or harvest of souls that would complete the wife of Christ would consist of those who had to wait under the altar for their fellow servants to be killed as they were. These are known as the tribulation saints and their number will only be complete at the midpoint of the seven year period. They will be the final portion of the harvest of souls that would be joined to the body of Christ through resurrection and ascension at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. I believe this will occur at the time when the two witnesses are resurrected from the dead and ascend into heaven. There are three parts to the body of Christ, just as there are three parts to Israel's harvest and just as there are three parts to the temple of God. We will look at this in more detail when we discuss the rapture. The three parts of the harvest of souls is called the first resurrection and it consists of Jesus' resurrection with some of the saints from the Old Testament, the main harvest of souls from the church age also initiating Daniel's 70th week, and finally the gleaning grapes at the midpoint of the seven year period. This is the first harvest, also known as the first resurrection. We see a little more detail provided to us about what those who are part of the first resurrection will be tasked with when the Lord returns to the earth. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. In addition to telling us about the first resurrection, this passage also shows us that those who are in Christ will receive authority to judge the world with Christ, even the angels, as we can see in a connected passage found in 1 Corinthians 6. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So to summarize then, it is clear that if we want to arrive at an understanding that avoids contradiction between passages in the Word of God, it requires the current heaven and earth to be done away with and a new heaven and earth to be created before the end of Daniel's 70th week. If this is not the case, we have contradictions with Daniel 9, Isaiah 24 and 34, 2 Peter chapter 3 and Revelation 6. Having the new heaven and the new earth existing at the start of the millennial reign is the only logical conclusion we can reach to understand how it would be possible for the remnant of Israel that will repopulate the new earth to have the long lifespans mentioned in Isaiah 66. If this is not the case, God will have to perform some restorative action on the earth in order to provide conditions that will allow life to continue. The earth at this point will be highly radioactive after several asteroid impacts and people will have no water to drink. Isaiah 30 clearly shows us that a new heaven and a new earth will be required and that when the current earth falls, it will not rise again. If God performed some restorative action on the earth after the judgments of revelation have been poured out upon it, it would contradict what is written in Isaiah 30. When we then consider the white throne judgment, we see that it cannot be positioned at the end of the millennium as traditional eschatology teaches, as this would contradict Isaiah 66 in which the Lord states that the new heaven and the new earth will be created to remain before him. It would also be problematic for the sea to deliver up the dead if it no longer existed. The only option available that does not cause contradiction is to have the white throne judgment occurring during the second half of Daniel's 70th week where the bride of Christ will observe as Jesus destroys the wicked in his winepress and afterwards be given the privilege to judge the world and the angelic realm with Christ. Now that we have a better understanding of how events will occur chronologically by interpreting the word of God, applying Isaiah 28 verse 10, let us now look at the first section of the sixth seal's judgment. 
This seal is the first instance in which the cosmic cataclysm leading to the destruction of the earth is mentioned. Once again we have some information that is provided to us in this passage, but we need to look at the detail and link it to other passages to obtain a better understanding of what is happening here. Fortunately, whenever we have a question about a passage in the Word of God, we can be sure that God has also provided us with answers in other passages of this amazing book about our question. I believe the detail that we need in order to better understand what is described in the sixth seal is provided to us in the seven trumpets and the seven bowl judgments. Many prophecy scholars believe and teach in traditional eschatology that the seven trumpets are contained within the seventh seal and that the seven bowls are contained within the seventh trumpet judgment. They also see these as occurring in chronological order and I used to hold to this view but I am now of the opinion that this view is incorrect as it approaches the subject expecting a chronological positioning of events instead of applying Isaiah 28 verse 10. I say this because of the pattern that emerges when comparing the trumpet and bowl judgments with each other. If we search for patterns and keep in mind that our Heavenly Father constructed His Word to provide a little information here and a little information there, as explained in Isaiah 28, we see that the trumpet and bowl judgments follow a very specific pattern that links them together when we consider the locations and effects mentioned in each of these judgments. Based on this pattern, we see then that each numbered trumpet is linked to the associated bowl judgment. Let me show you what I mean when we consider them side by side. When we compare the first trumpet and the first bowl judgments, we see the following. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast up in the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the first went, and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. These two passages begin with providing additional and complementary information in describing what I believe God's word is showing us will happen when seal 6 is opened. Both of these passages mention the effect that this judgment will have with a focus on the earth or dry land specifically. The information conveyed in the trumpet judgment provides detail on what will physically happen to the earth and the size of the area that will be affected as the earth moves through the tail of debris caused by the collision between Jupiter and Nibiru. The information given in the bowl judgment provides us with the specific impact or the effect that this judgment will have on those who will not be under God's protection on the earth at this time. We see the trumpet and bowl judgments describing what seem to be four impact events with the earth that all form part of what seal 6 is describing and occurring in relative short succession. We also know that these are indeed multiple impact events as can be seen in the following two passages and that it is not a, just a single impact that is, this, that is being described. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Both these passages describe stars in plural form being cast onto the earth. There is also evidence provided to us that shows us exactly how many impact events will occur. We will discuss this shortly. Looking at this from a cause and effect viewpoint, I believe we should keep in mind the fact that there are several nuclear power stations around the globe with the highest densities found in Europe and North America. If any of these nuclear power stations are exposed to and affected by meteor impacts, it may explain the effects as described in the associated bowl judgment on those who have the mark of the beast. If a third of the surface of the earth is exposed to a meteor shower, there will be massive radioactive consequences. These hybrid beings alive on the earth at the time when these judgments are executed will find themselves in bodies unable to die and living in conditions that will just keep getting worse. Let us look at the next two passages following this pattern. 
And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. The second trumpet and bowl judgments reference an impact event in an ocean, in contrast to the first two passages where we were dealing with dry land. The word used for sea in both these passages can be used to refer to the sea in general or to a specific ocean. Having a third once again mentioned in the trumpet judgment references the exposed area of the earth that will be affected by this impact, while the bowl judgment focuses on the effect of this judgment on the wicked and the specific ocean that is affected. Based on the information conveyed by these two passages, it would seem that there would be some reaction between the water and the foreign cosmic material with which it will come into contact when the earth encounters the tail of debris caused by the collision between Jupiter and Nibiru. We should once again keep in mind the impact of such an event on the levels of radiation on the earth as several nuclear power stations are situated in coastal regions of the continents. If an asteroid impacts the earth in any ocean, every nuclear power station in a coastal region of the earth will be affected in a similar way but on a much larger scale as we saw happening at Fukushima in Japan. Next we have the following. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers, and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. These two connected passages describe another burning asteroid hitting the earth and affecting the freshwater sources as referenced in both passages. We have additional information in the related bowl judgment showing us that all the freshwater sources are turned into blood as a result of this asteroid's impact and leaving those that are alive on the earth with water that is undrinkable. There will also be radioactive fallout that will be increasing and spreading to affect every location on the earth. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth! by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. The fourth trumpet and bowl describe the effect of the cosmic cataclysm on the celestial body, specifically the sun. I believe that some of the debris that resulted from the planetary collision will fall into the sun and will result in the sun's heat intensifying like adding fuel to a fire. I believe this will be associated with solar flares and massive coronal mass ejections that will greatly increase the temperature experienced on earth. We can already feel how the sun's heat is increasing and we know that this will get much worse in the years to come. This has nothing to do with greenhouse gases on earth or carbon emissions, as the governments of this world are leading us to believe. 
but has everything to do with the sun and the changes occurring in our solar system. And this is confirmed by Isaiah 30, describing the situation in more detail. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. We see another pattern that is directly linked to this description where heat is increased by seven times. And we find this in the encounter of Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace. This furnace was made seven times hotter and Daniel's friends were protected through it. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. This is such a perfect pattern that God provided us in his word for us to obtain more insight into the time that is about to come upon the earth. What is really interesting and noticeable about this incident is that Daniel was completely absent during this ordeal while his friends went through the furnace under God's protection. This will also tie into our discussion about the rapture that we will do in an upcoming video where a very clear pattern is provided to us about the tribulation of those who belong to our Heavenly Father and those who will be purified in the fire of God's wrath. Given then that the ambient temperature on earth could be increased to make it seven times hotter, you can imagine the agony of those who would live in these conditions combined with radioactivity, having no water to drink whilst not being able to die. We also know that the sun's heat will be increased before the end of the first half of Daniel's 70th week, as we can see the affliction of those who are beheaded suffering from the sun's heat, specifically mentioned in the following passage. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest? And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. When the fourth vial is poured out, we see that those that remain on earth did not repent even after all these plagues that have befallen them, and we now know why this is. Not even one person is mentioned as repenting from his works, and I believe this is because of what every one of those alive on earth at this point would have become. They would all have the mark of the beast, and repentance will no longer be an option available to those who chose to worship the beast instead of God. There is no forgiveness of sins or salvation available to those who are no longer made in the image of God and covered by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. This passage also confirms that at this point in time, there are no people left on earth who still have the original DNA that God created humanity with, except for the, for the remnant of Israel who would be protected by God from the things that will be happening on earth, just as Daniel's three friends were protected in the fiery furnace, and just as Noah was protected in the ark above the floodwaters. In the next video, we will continue this study and look at the final three trumpet and bowl judgments, as these are all associated with the events that will end Satan's reign over the earth and initiate the millennial reign of Christ. Thank you for watching the eighth installment in the series of God's Roadmap to the End. If you are interested in more information about this, and if you do not want to wait until the next video is made available, please download a free copy of God's Roadmap to the End ebook, which is linked in the section below. You will find a lot more detail in it that we still need to discuss in future videos, specifically concerning the rapture. I believe it will unlock many mysteries contained in God's Word for you. If this video is playing in a YouTube channel other than God's Roadmap to the End, please search on YouTube for the name shown in the banner below. All the links that are referred to in this video will be found there. I believe this information was preserved for those who love our Lord Yeshua and who are looking forward with all their heart to meeting Him in the clouds. 
I also believe that God is allowing us to discover His plans for the world in the coming months to be a testimony to those who doubt and to those who will be left behind. Please share this information with as many people as possible. It may be controversial, but I believe time will prove that God's word is true and reliable. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and subscribe as there will be more coming in the weeks and months before us. If you have any specific questions or comments, you are welcome to post them in the comment section or to send me a message if you would like to discuss something in particular. You will also find links to other videos in this series in the description below. Until next time, God bless.